Mm -hmm. Okay. Welcome, uh, everyone. So, my name is Ben, and I am one half of 2PM Studios, who are responsible for making The Song of the Fae, which is the game you can see on the screen right in front of you now. Uh, this is going to be the first presentation that I'm uploading for the game, but hopefully not the last. This one is probably a little longer than any of the future ones that I'll do, but I've given this talk once before to my work colleagues, and so, yeah, it should hopefully only be about 20 or 30 minutes, but I know that uh, 30 minutes is asking a lot of everyone. Feel free to skip through if you need to. So we're going to be talking about how the AI and the opponent system in general works in the Song of the Fae. So in the game, you play as this little blue man on the screen here with the nice hat and the silly smile. He's a bard. Uh, he can move around the map and recruit units by standing next to them. That's his charming influence. And then the other side, you have these skeletons and this uh, little goblin man in yellow. Those are the enemies. And this presentation is going to be focused on them. How do we decide what the enemies should do when they're playing against the player? So here's a little clip of the game. If you haven't seen it before, or even if you have, this is a nice refresher. You can see you can click on the bard, move around. If I end my turn here, who recruits the rogue? You can see my units attacking, my units getting attacked. The ogre there is a, uh, a boss in the game. The lancer here can charge at enemies. And if you want to learn anything more about the game, just visit the website or uh, follow me on Twitter. I upload the best resources. We also have an official Discord. And there's a demo for the game out now on both Itch and Steam. So be sure to check that out. So, quick facts about the game. It is indeed called The Song of the Fae. You play as a bard who charms others to do their bidding. I did already tell you that, but there's a second reminder. And it is a randomly generated, turn-based tactics game inspired by chess. Uh, and that rolls off the tongue. It's a really good marketing line. We're definitely trying to get it a little shorter still. More facts. This is game is made by me and my friend Ricky, who are, in fact, 2PM Studios together. Uh, it's built using Unity 3D and C Sharp. It's about 25,000 lines of C-sharp. Uh, that is not... It's not a lot, but it's not nothing. It's pretty extensive. It heavily uses the uh, Zenject language XNRX. I will not explain what these libraries do here. Uh, that's probably a subject of another talk, or you can look them up. But the main thing to think about here is that there is no inheritance in this code base, almost. Uh, no superclassing, no subclassing, except when we have to because of Unity. And the final point I wanted to put on here, which is just a little plug for me, is the art, animation, and UI are also all by me, as well as the programming. Um, I'm not talking about that side of things in this presentation, but I can, and if you'd like me to, let me know. So, what am I going to talk about today? Uh, I'm going to talk about the core game architecture briefly, because you need a bit of a preamble before I get into the AI system itself, and then, of course, the AI system, as I already mentioned. Um, so, the core game architecture. Our game is... Uh, it's not, unusual is probably the wrong word, but is unlike a lot of other games you may have seen written in Unity. It's very modular, decoupled, and event-driven. And what I mean by that is if you look at the log of events on the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see these events here like user mouse clicked, gameplay mouse clicked, rotate board, clockwise button pressed, map rotated, blah, blah, blah. Different, different, like, these are not just log events. These are the messages being sent in-game over an event bus that different systems listen to and respond to. So uh, the way that this works in practice, you can see on the bottom left, is you have a listener here for uh, when units moves finish, and we filter that to only units on the allies team. And as in the subscription method, we dispatch more events, which will trigger more, um, more listeners, blah, 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 as a loop, which will lead you into something like this. Now, this is a bit of a scary diagram. I call it a unidirectional reactive architecture in big quotes. Uh, if you've used anything like React on the front end for web development or Vue, what's that, not Vue, um, it can be done in Vue, but Elm, uh, any of the MVU systems, this will seem familiar. And it will seem familiar if you've done any event sourcing or event driven architecture style in general. But to be honest, we're not going to go too deep into this. Um, we're going to focus mainly on the events box on here and the gameplay systems part. So how do those parts of this interrupt with each other? It's where most of the game code is. It's the interesting part. So that looks a bit more like this. Uh, you have events that go into systems that become events that go into systems. 
go from events, we go into systems, and you can see how this gets big, right? And this is not just an exercise in saying, oh, my game's hard to understand. This is making the point that this is how you can build something very modularly. Like we don't have to explicitly wire things together. We can listen for events and compose gameplay systems very simply on top of the ones that are already there. Um, I will be able to talk more about this in a future presentation if someone would like me to, but to be honest, I would start with any of the resources I already mentioned about event-driven design in general. So obviously this gets pretty crazy when you get, take it to the limit. Keynote started messing up here for me. Um, and this is like, if you haven't seen this before, you're probably like, what, why would you do this? What are the trade-offs? So on the positive side, there's a high degree of modularity here. And I know I already said this once, but it's very important to talk about modularity because it's probably the most important thing in software. Um, we can add new gameplay systems often without even writing, a, sorry, changing a single line of code in any of the existing systems. And that becomes very powerful when you have a game as complicated and emergent as ours. Uh, it lends itself to functional programming patterns. It's very uh, pure. We, the functions that receive an event and turn it into more events can almost always be pure functions, which uh, we like over in this world of functional programming. It's easily testable. So once again, those pure functions are easily testable. It's predictable because of that. Um, I've written debuggable here. Event-driven systems can be more debuggable in a sense because they have a very good log of what happened in what order, but they can also be hard to debug because you lose a lot of the traditional stack trace you might expect to get in um, the more traditionally written code. It does make refactoring quite simple and it make, makes it easy to optimize where it matters. I, I said that, I'm not sure it makes it easy, it just means you should optimize where it matters. That's always what you should do. On the negative side, it does require careful planning of the event lifecycle. This means I get out a piece of paper often at the start of a new system and I draw arrows saying like what events happen in what order, what are the conceptual flows in the game. And that process is, I think, very enriching for the design ultimately if you can, um, if you can practice it, but it is more effort. That it means you can't just charge in coding blindly. The biggest problem with this from my perspective from a game uh, engine point of view the one game engine, game framework point of view, is that the performance implications are not very obvious. So you're allocating a lot of memory, at least in, in C Sharp, you certainly are allocating a lot of memory to achieve this. And it's not obvious what the overhead is to these events because they are, you never see them all together at once. You only see them at runtime in the game. So those inter-system problems could become challenging. Now in our game, it's very turn-based. So it's not a, not a huge problem. We have we're not real time, we're not high action. I think that that would be a very different use case and I would have to re-architect a lot of the game to be a bit faster. I would still prefer to think in terms of events regardless, but I think there are ways to do that in more performant um, patterns. So I mentioned emergence once uh, already on the previous slide, but emergence, the, the point of doing things this way is to give ourselves emergence. And what I mean by emergence here is that it's not always obvious what's going to happen from the interaction of the systems in the game. We have simple systems interacting to create complexity, and this is awesome, but it's also really tough because it means that we have to actually try and tailor the experience to rule out the situations that emerge in the game that we think are bad, but we have to keep the ones in that we think are good, and we have to sort of steer the game as we uncover what it could be. Um, I'll probably talk more about this in the future too, the idea of finding your game, carving it out of a design space. Uh, there's good talks on this already by, um, by various people, but I think that I could talk about it as well. So how, how do we actually make a worthy opponent for our little blue guy here? Uh, this is getting into the meat of the presentation. So we're going to get to the AI system itself. What is the problem statement here? We have a board, a two-dimensional grid, and it's full of units of different teams. Each unit could make one of many moves, and we must pick one unit to do one move each turn. And it also has to be fun to play against. I know this is like obvious, but this isn't on the list for a lot of AI systems, and it shows. So it has to be challenging, it has to be something you can learn, and you can play against and find it entertaining but it can't be psychic it can't predict what you're going to do perfectly it can't you know it can't take the fun out of the game the player has to have the advantage sometimes so i as with most complex design things i start out with simple questions that we need to be able to answer 
What moves can a given unit make? Well, I mean, they, we'll, we'll see on the future slides, but they can, they can move in uh, the orthogonal directions on each turn. And how good are those moves? That's a really hard question. How do we know how good a move is? Because if we had the answers to these questions, we could do what we say at the bottom here. We can ask all the units for their moves, get a list, and sort it by how good they are, and we're all done, right? But, yeah, how do we know exactly what moves a unit can make, and how do we tell how good a move is? Now, it's... This might seem like a very complex computation to do, right? You're going to be looping over the board, looking for all sorts of patterns. Um, how do you come up with useful uh, results from this? All right. So... Yeah, I forgot about this slide. As you can see, uh, the skeleton doesn't know what it should do, and we're going to find out how it should determine that. So, imagine this is the board. This is the two-dimensional grid. It's got the blue units, it's got the yellow units, and we're focusing on this yellow unit uh, encircled in white in there. This unit, like many units in our game, can move in the four cardinal directions, like a rook in chess. Um, so these green squares are all places this unit could move. All of them are available, all of them are valid, there's nothing in the way. So that's our list of possible move locations taken care of. Now, other units have different movement types, but you can see that this is actually a very simple question to say, where can a unit move? We just have to find three squares that line up with this shape. But there are some squares here that we care significantly more about. These ones actually have more value to the an enemy unit because on the left-hand side, we can move next to one of the blue units and attack. That's pretty good. But on the right-hand side, we can move next to one of the blue units, and there's already a teammate there attacking that blue unit. So we'd have a pretty good advantage if we move down there. So how do we get the stars? That's where we're getting to now. How do we find just the points of interest on the board instead of uh, every square? Well, I uh, use the term heuristics for this part. We think of what makes those spots on the board special and we think of what defines them and what's what a heuristic is it's a simple well it doesn't have to be simple but it should be a simple rule in this case that can tell us what uh, situations are possible for the unit to get into or get out of such as could it move next to an enemy can it assist an ally in attacking a unit can it run away from certain death these are our heuristics very literally and if you see on this next slide, in the game, we have a function here called getUnitMoves, and it takes a unit ID for which unit's making the move, and we run, literally, the heuristics of dancing, uh, sorry, in this red box, we run each of these heuristics to determine what moves the unit can actually make. So, you've got things like can take units, can move next to units, but we've also got specialized ones for bosses and for enemies down the bottom. And this is what creates that set of possible noteworthy moves. So it's not just any square on the board that the unit can move to, but squares where something interesting can happen is what this piece of code right here gives us. So that gives us uh, what moves the unit can make. How do we know how good those moves are? We're going to get into the opponent system in depth now. So you can see uh, the red box is where we just started with running the heuristics right there. And on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the turn started event kicks this off. Turn started um, triggers the get unit moves function, which runs the heuristics and uh, pulls together a list of units. You can see down beneath run heuristics, we have several other boxes, and we're going to move through each of these on the way through the system. So each unit has its own base desires. Uh, based on its abilities, it, it decides to do different things with different um, priorities. So, for example, this grappler, as you can see, he really wants to lick you. And when the grappler can set up in a position where he'll, uh, he'll get to lick you, he puts liked as his move priority in that red box. So, it's not urgent. He can overcome this urge, apparently. Uh, but there are some moves that are urgent, like avoiding death. And this is a simple way for the unit to say, I'm panicking, I kind of want to do this, or I'd like to do this. This is where we start at the generation. So, um, to be clear... Uh, the, this is a, something that comes out of the heuristics. The heuristics return moves with a base move priority baked in. Each unit then has a personality on top of this. So if every skeleton acts the same, it's pretty easy to predict them all. Uh, varieties, the spies of life, etc. So what, what does this mean in practice by a personality for a unit? Well, this is a, from the very early notes in the game. I pulled this out for this presentation. Uh, units have two different axes into their personality. So they can be 
chaotic to strategic, and they can be bold to timid. And each unit has a placement on this 9x9 nine nine grid that defi defines its personality, which is a unique element separate from its unit type or anything else like that. And as you can see here, this is not visible on the cards anymore, but we used to show it to the player. Now we think we're just going to keep it internal for the time being, but this ghost was both timid and strategic. Uh, something that I think a ghost is good at is being timid and strategic, actually. And you can see in smallish print on this slide uh, the way that these actually affect the game. So we've got in three red boxes the multipliers for the different personality traits. There's strategy multipliers, timid multipliers, and bravery multipliers. Um, the, as you can see on each row of this, there's effectively one of those heuristics, like a type of move or a situation, and we have a scaling factor uh, of how much this kind of personality influences this particular heuristic. So an example is looking in the bravery multipliers in the bottom right, the can take the player has a 1.4 times multiplier on it because this unit is brave and would really like to take care of that work. Whereas on the left, in the timid multipliers section, the can take the player heuristic is scaled down to 0 0.691, very precise for some reason. Um, and this is the units prefer not to do these kinds of moves. So we can tune the way the units behave and uh, like interact with the player based on this layer quite nicely. So we apply the personality on top of those base heuristics and we have some idea of how much these units actually want to do this stuff. But that doesn't tell us how good these moves are. It tells us how much the units want to do them. That's, and this, uh, this next part, we'll get into ranking the moves. So, how do we calculate the score for a given move? You can see here we've got the get unit moves function has popped up again in the first red box. And the score is the move score for the move and the unit's personality, which we just talked about, the personality system, plus the intelligence interference in the other box. So we're still talking about move score at the moment here. And we have this uh, weighting as well. So this is the opponent system itself, what we call the brain of the opponent system has these preferences. So it really likes the idea, for example, of taking the player. It likes that 10 times more than it likes the idea of just doing something because it feels curious. Uh, all of these weightings here are how good I, the developer, were I playing against the player, would think these moves are. So putting myself in the perspective of, of being the uh, enemy in the game, how good are these moves, in my opinion. And this is applied on top of the personality, again, as a scaling factor. You can see here in the game output, there's uh, you can see the crown, that's what we call it. The crown is the, the brain of the AI system. And underneath that, on the second line downwards, you can see first the timestamp, then a score calculated for how good a move is, what um, move would, sorry, what reason for the move is being given, and the unit ID that wants to do the move with arrows between them. So going down this list is a ranked order of all the moves available to the AI system, along with the scores for those moves. And it will pick the top one in this case, because it's the best move. Except that we have this other piece called the intelligence interference factor. And this is a pretty funny piece of code, which is why I put it in there. I got the dumbness constant, one minus intelligence, just these are silly looking at things. But what this lets us do is apply random variation to the scores in the, uh, in the list. So based on how big the dumbness constant is and how intelligent the AI is, these are both things that can be adjusted. Um, the dumbness constant I would expect to keep the same from build to build, but the intelligence factor moves during a given run. You can scale up the AI. And based on this, we apply a bit of jitter to the scores put in that final list. And this lets the AI sometimes randomly swap moves around in its ranking, leading to uh, some, you know, some variation, some randomness in choice. It's like you're not just playing a perfect computer simulation. And so that's it. We've done everything in this red box. We've run the heuristics, applied the personality, weighted it based on what the opponent system itself thinks, applied the dumbness, and picked the top move. Then we dispatch this unit move attempted event, the unit move completed, and the turn ended. And that's what a given turn looks like for the AI system. Um, that's it. I didn't prepare anything further than this, but uh, please tell me what you thought in the comments. And if you have any questions about the game, ask them on Twitter. If, um, follow the game at the website here, 2pm.studio slash SOTF, Song of the Fae. And yeah, thank you. I'll see you next time.